Lionel. Copy pages. Good evening and thank you to everyone here joining us on Zoom and all people watching at home. Uh, I'm Akhil Rashid, Research and Knowledge Hub Chief at JKPI. Uh, before presenting the proceedings of today's session of JKPI's talk series initiative, I would like to touch upon the health crisis situation going on in the country. I take this opportunity to offer my condolences and prayers to the families and friends of the victims of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would be amiss if I didn't acknowledge the role of all the frontline healthcare workers who are working day and night to care about people having contracted COVID-19. I pray, pray for a quick recovery for those affected and health and safety for, for us all. Let's be responsible and follow government health guidelines to keep ourselves and others safe from COVID-19. In our previous sessions of the expert talk series, our guest speakers discussed the topic, topics, gender equality in entrepreneurship and businesses and role of uh, civil society organizations in achieving gender equality. Tonight, we are here to present the fifth session of the Expo Talk series on the theme, Gender Equality and Religion. The vision and intention of the Expo Talk series is to source inputs and recommendations from experts in various fields pertaining to different sub uh, sustainable development goals through one-on-one -on -one dialogues. We have initiated this series to engage expert, experts, change makers, pioneers from various walks of life to understand the dynamic context of implementing the sustainable development goals on our agenda. Uh, allow me uh, to now introduce our speaker who will be talking to us on the topic gender equality and religion. Our co Mitra Ghatak is a PhD scholar at the South Asian uh, Asia Institute of the University of. Heidelberg uh, since 2019. Her doctoral uh, project is titled The Female Guru as Jagat Jayan, Jan, Janani, a transcultural history of various motherhood in the 19th and 20th centuries. Her project is funded by uh, the German Acad Academic Exchange Service. She is a disciple of one, uh, 108 Siri Siri Subha Mata, Mataji, the fifth the uh, fifth, uh, 56th guru of the uh, Nimb Barka uh, Vesnava sect. She is also an interfaith activist and has worked with the India chapter of Euphrates Institute and is currently consulting for the Hope Archive project of JKPI. On, our, on behalf of the entire team of JKPI, I welcome you tonight. Uh, now I would like to pass on the mantle to Sohini Jana, our facilitator for the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akil, for uh, that brilliant introduction and for introducing the vision and uh, intention behind the Expert Talk series. Uh, without further ado, we would love to have um, welcome Orkomitra, Ms. Orkomitra Ghatok and um, delve right into um, all the questions that we have um, you know, curated to ask her. Uh, we would definitely be having a Q&A session at the end of the event. So please stay till the end because I promise you it's going to be a riveting discussion. So um, to introduce um, Orkomitra, we'd like to know more about your research work and um, what led you to pursue the topic, your doctoral uh, research topic and what is its relevance in the world today? If you could throw some light on that, please. Thank you, Shohini. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I am definitely no expert, but I'm sort of uh, pursuing this line of work and it's 
always great to have an opportunity to brainstorm together with you on issues of religion and gender equality to topics which not only concern both of us but i think is a pertinent global issue today and before i begin i would like to sort of offer my condolences uh, for the on the death of uh, molana wahiuddin khan uh, a stalwart who's who not only has forwarded the cause of global peace through the an islamic and religious framework but has also empowered so many women through his organization so as we discussed today i think we can dedicate this talk to him and to the legacy he leaves behind for all of us and uh, to begin with my research of course uh, to a certain extent my research was informed by my own personal background i was initiated at the age of 7 by sri sri shobha mata ji who who was one of the foremost female gurus and the first non brahmin guru in a very orthodox nambarka vaishnava sect and uh, i she passed away when i was only 10 years old so most of my ad adulting life my teenage life had been sort of engaging with the work she has left behind the legacy she has left left behind and an attempt to figure out how to integrate her teachings with my very liberal upbringing and, and training as a historian uh, and that process has gone through a lot of crisis a lot of questioning a lot of skepticism but also a sense of feeling divinely supported and um for a long time um i was very skeptical as a historian on taking on this project on working on female gurus because i thought my own personal uh, sort of uh, philosophical and faith might interfere with the way i perceive my subjects but then i realized that instead of being a hurdle that could actually be a very enriching form of looking as long as i'm critical yet i am aware of my position through which i look because i think a part of my a part of the reason why i took up this project was to was to change uh, because i had a problem with the way religion has been approached in history to a certain extent because still the boundary that religion is something which is antithetical to modern life exists to a certain extent and what what my work tries to show is that it is not so that there is a relevance of religion in our modern life and at the same time we need to critically engage with what we take from our tradition and how do we adapt it to our progressive lives and what i'm trying to do through my studying of the female gurus is to see how in the late 19th and early 20th centuries how were they how were they attracting so many people to them who who came from diverse backgrounds who came from across different nationalities who came from different religious backgrounds and still they found them to be one of their own so i'm looking at a globe as somebody who is interested in sort of a global discourse of global peace and harmony i'm interested in seeing how these gurus sort of generated the spaces where everybody found something of their own in which they found a safe space to be to use a word we use nowadays in peace building so that largely that has informed my work to a certain extent that was um very very um articulate uh, or kumitra thank you for that um now when we talk about contemporary relevance of uh, the kind of work that you're doing the kind of research that you're doing and you're delving deep into history to source out um contemporary relevances while you're also looking at the context from um the point of view of if i'm not wrong 18th and 19th century um uh, did i get the late 19th right? early 20th century okay late 19th and early 20th century 
So um, if you had to now look at female gurus or teachers as stakeholders in social upliftment and change, what kind of leadership do you think they would embody? So over here, the relevance part, like how would you uh, look at their leadership in the current context? And would you say that this kind of leadership is the same as male religious leadership? Um, if yes, why? If no, then also why? <laughs> Uh, well, to be honest, uh, guruhood itself as a category, it it doesn't talk about the human body. So it doesn't take the idea of, gen in principle, it doesn't take the idea of gender into account. It is supposed to be a divine force of redemption that comes, that descends to lead mankind to uh, out of ignorance into realizing their oneness with divine source. So uh, the, every, every guru will tell you that guruhood is not something that is limited to the body. Yes, the body through which the guru takes you is holy to you, but it is not a power that is limited to the body. So in principle, whether a guru is a male or a female does not matter. The function remains the same. Having said that, obviously, because we have all had a patri uh, it's a patriarchal society, we mostly come across male gurus and female gurus are very few to be found. And even when you find them, mostly we see them. So if you, if you look, if you take a cursory glance, you'd be disappointed as a feminist because they seem like they're, they're following patriarchal codes. They don't, because they do not set out to be social reformers. They do not set out to be religious reformers either, but the gurus I study on taking a deeper look, I realized without making any grand gestures or any declarations, they did away with so many of patriarchal and caste based norms that were not necessary by using their own inner wisdom through which they gave scriptural authority. They were, they were not setting out to violate scriptural authority or do away with it they gave it newer forms of interpretation in keeping with the times. If I have to cite examples from Shobha Mataji's ashram, in which, as I told you, she was the first non-Brahmin guru of the sect. And while she was come, uh, sort of, at first her claims were not taken seriously by, and they were contested by the, the main branches of the sect, but then, she stood, I mean, she stood her ground in a sense that she neither protested nor anything. And in time, they were, they accepted her. And in her own ashram, the distinctions of eating food, uh, of upper caste sitting separately was completely done away with. And women were allowed to worship uh, the Shalagram Shila, which is an, uh, an iconic form of Vishnu that Hindus worship. Traditionally, uh, according to Orthodox canons, women are not allowed to touch the Shalagram Shila. But in her ashram, women and, uh, and women of non-Brahmin uh, origin handle and serve the Shalagram Shila. And she was asked, uh, are you trying to violate scriptural orth orthodoxy by allowing women to touch it? Why, why are women allowed? And she said, women and Brahmin? Brahmin is, a, is not a category of the body. Brahmin and even caste-based distinctions are questions of aptitude that we have forgotten and we have reduced caste into a birth-based category. And my purpose is to restore that. So everyone who works in my ashram and serves the Shalagram Shila is a Brahmin by aptitude. Their gender doesn't matter, their caste doesn't matter. What matters is their inner aptitude and inner purity. So, so, so what they did was they took the inner essence inner essence of the shastras of the scriptural authority in light of their inner wisdom and gave it newer interpretations which which were more in keeping with the times i would um i would want to um sum that up as maybe a very creative way of looking at reform 
while not uh, necessarily changing a lot of things structurally. Um, and that I believe is a very unique um, aspect of uh, the leadership of female gurus and saints as uh, your examples uh, cite. That is truly insightful. Now, uh, leading on from there, when we speak about gender equality in religion, we do have to admit that there have been hurdles, there have been challenges, there still are in fact, even in the 21st century. So what do you think should be the priority areas that one has to work with when uh, we are looking at um, reinterpreting religion and looking at certain uh, social uh, behaviors uh, and norms that um, obviously uh, should be reevaluated? Uh, so what would you say are the pri uh, priority areas um, from your perspective as a um, religious, scholar, uh, religious studies scholar and why? I think uh, for me, the foremost would be in democratizing access to scripture. I believe that religious studies need to be integrated or sort of some amount of scripture needs to be integrated into our so-called secular education because we, we function from this idea that religion is a personal category, which I, I do not think any empirical evidence, especially in South Asia today shows that to be true because religion is very much a public issue. But since we function from the idea that it is a personal one, we tend to ignore the aspect of educating our youngsters about it, leading to them either taking it, uh, sort of getting ideas about religion from sources which are not very helpful or maybe sometimes downright fanatical. Uh, or completely developing a distaste for it in keeping with the majoritarian discourse. So what I do, while I do believe religion is an individual affair, I also believe it's a public affair. So education in scriptures, I think, is very important, irrespective of gender, irrespective of caste, irrespective of religion. And then I think we need to empower we need to incorporate into the ethical and moral training system that we that we provide to our youngsters yeah. and sort of empower them to make their own choices so that they can critically engage with the received tradition and make their own choices on the basis of the ethical training they have received of which part of our received tradition works with a modernist with a progressive society and in building a progressive society i would say i think empowering the notion of agency is very important so i think what we need to do is equip our youngsters irrespective of gender to be able to negotiate their own path with their faith and make choices through such engagements um, I totally hear you, Kapitra. In fact, um, what strikes me um, personally very, very deeply was this um, whole idea, was your, um, you know, idea that uh, it is important to critically engage with the tradition which is handed down. So in a culture where uh, there is obviously a top-down hierarchy of not questioning and obeying, and this has been a part of um, uh, many religious traditions and many, many societies which are, um, which fall somewhere in the conservative um, and orthodox, um, you know, part of the spectrum. Uh, there is definitely this uh, lack of um, a reflection and an informed reflection on why there is a need to critically engage and why that should be actually allowed. And that doesn't necessarily call into question the fact that, um, a young person will reject their own tradition if they are allowed to critically engage. I mean, that is, I think, a fear which is still somewhere there. And that is one of the reasons why no one wants to talk about religion or nobody wants to um, attempt a critical engagement with their own tradition. There's always this fear that that would cause a sort of distancing of the self. Um, but you're correct when, uh, when you say that in our education system, we should understand that religion is something we cannot avoid. And religion influences our culture, religion influences how we actually uh, understand the sense of community. It actually forms our first idea of uh, who is our community uh, to a great extent. 
So um, now coming straight to um, how religion as a social tool and as a, also a structural tool can be uh, looked at and analyzed uh, to for us to understand better how patriarchy is propagated through religion. What would you say, like your observations, perhaps maybe memories that you would want to share um, as a woman who's studying religion, how would you say patriarchy is propagated through religion? Well, fortunately for me, in my guru's ashram, for a long time, I did not understand that religion was patriarchy patriarchal to a great extent. It was only while growing up and in an instant, I sort of encountered religion in a more institutional setting that I realized that yes, religion has so many patriarchal aspects to it that it restricts women from technically uh, in Hinduism, women are not allowed, women and shudras, lokas are not allowed to touch the Vedas. And then, but then, all of these restrictions and the female body, of course, because it's a menstruating product is considered impure. So there are all of these conundrums. Of course, it exists almost in every religious tradition. In the Jewish tradition, uh, it, there are tracts which say that uh, you would a man would die if they touch a menstruating woman. So, uh, so almost every religion has a very misogynistic view of what the female bodies and that was uh, in the realm of guruhood it was no different for a very long time there were tracts that were written where uh, where even things have been said that um, what is the purpose of making a woman a guru if you make a woman a guru your your uh, your intellect is destroyed uh, it she would just leave you dead and ignorant so there is this disdain for the female body. Having said that, in a parallel way, we have also seen the presence of female gurus. They have, 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 the, have their growth been sort of contended by the family members. In case we have uh, the 17th century Saint Bahini Bai, her husband, uh, her husband kept uh, mistreating her because she had a spiritual inclination, but she, she performed her duties as a devoted wife, but held on to her, her faith. And in, in the end, he was forced to recognize her spiritual role. And in the tantric literature, we find examples of wives who have initiated their husbands into spiritual awakening. So who became spiritual adepts first and then led their husbands, who also at first thought they ignored their wives' advice. They thought they were better off and what, what can our wives teach us? They're stupid. And then we have actually elaborate tales where the wives dressed themselves as men and then went and sort of gave initiation to their husbands and then later revealed themselves to their wife, as their wives. And then the husbands were convinced, okay. So women have always faced a marginalization, but they have always found ways of transcending it as well. So in my uh, in my ashram, I've even seen my my Guruji, Shobha Mataji, follow all uh, when sa so when sadhu seva happens, women are not supposed to serve them because uh, because uh, the sadhus are ascetics and uh, touching the woman or coming close to the woman can make generate problems for their celibacy. So I've never seen her violate those rules. But what I find interesting about the way she taught was, um, so there was this uh, incident where, um, where she preached gender equality. So in the form of a very uh, entertaining story. So everybody was supposed to take a boat ride in the Varanasi. And the men said, uh, oh, no, 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 this time, uh, only, only women have to pay. We men won't be paying for the boat ride. The women have to sponsor us. And our Guruji said, okay. And the women then went to her and said, why did you say yes to it? Uh, do you believe in this? And she said, why? I only believe that Sri Krishna is the only man. I don't know any other man. So whoever else is left has to pay. 
So there are very, there are very interesting parable like quality through which she taught, which I find very interesting. And can I have the slides now? Because I'd like to show you a slide to show the ingenious way in which she taught. If I take her as a model, she taught because I'd like to make a point through it. And not the video, uh, the PPT, please. Yes, so can you make uh, go to the fourth one? Yeah, so this is Shobha Mat yeah, this one. There, there is Shobha Mataji driving a car. And, and this is somebody who is a spiritual adept. She's driving a car. And here you should see her playing the carom with her disciples, which is a board game. She's playing a board game with her disciples and she's tending to her own garden. The reason I use these pictures, and I couldn't use another picture which shows her in a trouser. This is a spiritually adept girl at the age of 17 wearing a trouser, which was in 1950s, quite modern for women. Most more, even the modernest of women won't, would not have thought of wearing a trouser at that age. But the reason I show these pictures, because they have a story to it, why? So one of her disciples told me that when we were children, she would play hide and seek with us. And then she would tell us that your life's purpose is to catch me. Once you have caught God, there is no way to uh, leave God. So while playing with children, she imparted spiritual lessons to them through playing hide and seek. And then the gardening, uh, a very important lesson was given through her while gardening. When she was gardening, some people told her, you tend so much to those plants, but many of those do not bear any fruits. So why do you spend so much time on them? And then she explained through that the, the principle of detachment taught by the Bhagavad Gita. She said, I do not, ex I do not serve the plants because I expect any fruits from them. I serve them because it is my duty to serve them and they get pleasure from it. So that's a reason why I, I just wanted to highlight the unique ways in which female gurus imparted education. Instead of creating, instead of generating religion as a separate category of a very, something in which you need to conform to scripture, they integrated it within life, within our lifestyle, that religion is something that, that is in an integrated whole, which we can practice at every second in our life, no matter what we do, even when we are driving a car. So it is not something that is disharmonious with a very individual oriented modern lifestyle. So uh, from all your examples and the presentation, um, I hear two things which are of a very important um, value uh, to this discussion. One is the way the body of the woman is perceived in religion um, and also uh, how attire or the way one um, carries themselves in the different roles and in uh, that they play and various social interactions um, that in way in order for someone to be uh, legitimized um, as a guru. Uh, so that is, and, and given the fact that um, the examples you shared are from the 1950s, it is indeed, um, uh, I would say revolutionary in a certain sense uh, for, uh, uh, Shobama to actually um, embody all of this and impart uh, to everyone the importance of um, doing what is genuine, what is uh, the, the teachings and the wisdom and to look beyond the body and the attire and um, to rise above uh, the sex and gender while looking at divine wisdom being channeled. So that is very interesting, especially more interesting because um, even today, we have um, witch hunts happening in many villages, um, unfortunately. There are women who are demonized. 
um, there is a definite projection of women as um, seductresses, as the ones who would lead you or lure you away from God. So in that sense, um, how do you think the role of the feminine should be supported in the Hindu tradition? What kind of reformative um, lens of interpretation is needed in order to, in order to um, move beyond these practices that are uh, prevalent even today? It's a very interesting question. And I think it is the conundrum of our religion today that um, even, even the earth worshipping, the mother worshipping tantric traditions, they were not necessarily very matriarchal. They had strong patriarchal underpinnings because the practice, although they were bowing down to a female deity, it was mostly male practitioners and it, the, the, the support of the female practitioner would be sought in times of certain esoteric sexual rights. So even while accepting her and worshipping the female body as the channel of this divine energy, it not necessarily generated a lot of scope for their empowerment. Having said that, what we what is the need of the hour is the principle of, and I think that is what female gurus who were identified as divine mothers in human bodies showed us by carrying that principle to its, uh, by, by showing the full potential of what that principle is, that indeed the human female body can embody the highest, highest potency of divine power, that the human is essentially divine and you just need to realize it. And I think mostly uh, it is not religion as such or our mystical tradition which talks of which promotes gender inequality. It is our, it's our cultural ideas, it is patriarchy, which is prevalent everywhere, that I that sort of makes the female body the scapegoat of all the fears that men who are mostly those who wrote the scriptures down had. And the female body sort of became a very preferred mode of scapegoat for channeling all those anxieties. What we need is nothing short of a reclamation of our tradition to restore, I would say, a female gaze to the way we deal with received tradition. And I think it has been happening across the world. I wanted to give the example of Zaina Anwar in Malaysia, who has formed this organization called Sisters in Islam, which works to promote rights of women through an Islamic framework uh, and principles of equality, justice, freedom, uh, as enshrined in the Quran. And she's working against polygamy, child marriage, hudud, and all, all of the misogynistic laws in Sharia and how she's showing that they're not compatible with the Quranic principles. And we need a reformation of our tradition through in the light of what the Quran says. And in Bengal, in our region, I don't know if you're aware of her, Nondini Bhomik is doing amazing work. She is the first, she's not the first, but she's today one of the foremost of female Hindu Purohits or priestesses in Bengal. And uh, she officiates Hindu rituals and sh she herself is a Sanskrit professor. So she has renegotiated the tradition. She has done away with the Kanya Dan ceremony in marriage, which means that essentially a woman can be given away as a gift, as an object. She has done away with it. And I was listening to a video by her where she said that a family insisted that the Kanyadan ritual be performed. And she said, okay, then I perform it because, but then Kanyadan will be followed by Putradan where you have to give your son away to the girl as well. Would you do that? So, <laughs> so and she's also a campaigner against this myth of menstrual impurity. So they're doing amazing work in trying to harmonize that science and religion are not two poles apart. And I think this is an education which is the need of the hour. I think what we saw a few days back in our country that a mass gathering and a religious festival was held dis despite our country reeling under COVID and which turned out to be a super spreader. So what we need is a more progressive 
a, a scientific understanding of religion and basically not shut our brains down while we are engaging with the category of religion. Unfortunately, today, I think more than not, religion has become an excuse of taking offense instead of, instead of it being part of one's self-discovery. So I would argue for a form of religious education that empowers choice, that empowers agency, and one that empowers full opportunities for self-discovery. I totally hear you, Arpamitra. It's like um, religion today has become something like a shield which anybody can take up and refuse to engage in a discussion that might be uncomfortable or difficult. And um, also regarding the, um, the idea about, um, you know, misogynistic practices, um, other than social practices, which are obviously misogynistic and are, uh, you know, extensions of patriarchal norms, um, it is also interesting to note how um, female sexuality is feared so much and that fear is fanned uh, and that also has an effect on the way religious traditions um, uh, try to control um, women's agency or will. Uh, and this is something that uh, is uh, very interesting to me uh, because when you look at the norms and what to do and what not to do cited, they are not as tight or rigidly implemented and there are areas for maneuvering um, when it comes to the men, but it's not the same for women. And there are tighter norms on women and um, uh, in terms of how they are even engaging in community, particularly in, in really conservative cultures, you see this a lot, like it's very, very visible. Now, uh, coming to the, uh, you know, um, to your um, analysis and role as a historian, um, we would like to know more about the inequalities um, in the positions of upper caste women and lower caste women. Uh, in postmodern Indian society, uh, because once upon a time, um, particularly in the medieval ages, as we know, there were a lot of, um, uh, you know, saints who were Dalits and from lower class, uh, lower castes, who actually contributed very richly to the Bhakti tradition. Uh, given the way you have studied how the history of uh, India of the Indian subcontinent has evolved, would you say that that kind of contribution and, uh, you know, that kind of contribution and that kind of position is uh, possible in today's world, given the kind of crisis of faith we are all uh, facing. Do you think it would be accepted? What would you say is the situation? You're reading, please. Um, that's a challenging question, you know. Obviously, uh, the first part of it, did, did a huge gap exist between upper caste and lower caste women? Yes. Low caste women have always been doubly oppressed, if you can say. The modes of oppression for, I think, upper caste and low caste women have been different. Upper caste, there have been expectations from upper caste women uh, in a certain way. Uh, I think in the by the late 18th century, uh, early 19th century, the 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 most of the debates around sati were centered around the bodies of upper caste women. Low caste women comparatively enjoyed autonomy there because they were allowed to remarry. The widows were allowed to remarry in those communities. And, but then upper caste women, because they were mostly the property classes as well, as we all know, sati or the burning of the widow was less a religious affair than a question of denying the woman a share of property she was entitled to by the Hindu law prevalent in Bengal by just killing her off. So religion always has a huge economic and political subtext, which we cannot ignore as, as scholars. And even I think we don't have to be a scholar for that. Anybody negotiating religion should be aware of the political and economic forces at play. I think without being aware of it, it is very difficult to critically engage with religion, which is what we are trying to sort of 
um, promote through this dialogue. So I think everybody should, instead of taking religion as this category, as you said, which cannot be questioned, we have to look at all the forces which are playing beneath and be aware of those forces. Only in, in, those, in those circumstances, by critically engaging with those undercurrents, would we be able to reform perceived tradition into what, in terms of what works. So uh, yes, they have been doubly uh, oppressed and more, more prone to sexual violation and exploitation as well. Many uh, upper caste. I mean, we have we have heard stories of uh, women uh, honor. Obviously, honor killing is a huge issue, and it's linked to the question of caste. And we have always. Am I? Am I see? Yeah, oh, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think it was the connection. Yeah. Um. So. Definitely that has been there, but going back to the Bhakti saints, even among Bhakti saints like Namdev and Tukaram, who have obviously made religion more accessible to untouchables and women through their poetry and by preaching in the local languages, there had also been quite a few female Bhakti saints. Obviously Mirabai is there, but she was a princess, an upper caste princess. But there was also the case of Janabai, who was, she was a servant in the house of Namdev. And then she became a disciple of the Toba, wrote poetry that challenged patriarchal norms about the women's body and sort of altogether. She used her status as servant in the house of Namdev to present her identity as a servant of God, the Toba. Why she also said that my pallu falls and I'm a slut in the bazaar. And it, but through that, she sort of challenged the idea of sort of guarding the sexuality of women by sort of removing every covering in between her and Vitoba, between her and God. So using these metaphors, uh, metaphors about control sexuality and body, I find it as a, I and even many other scholars have pointed out, these are interesting ways in which these women subverted these received uh, the codes of patriarchal control by sub surrendering themselves to the divine. Right? It's a form of, it's nothing short of reclaiming the discourse by subverting its patriarchal implications. Um, I will definitely look that up further because that sounds very interesting, um, not to mention very out there, but um, I'm glad that such poetry has been written. Um, yes. We definitely need to popularize them more so that the female body is not always demonized and um, held, as a, held as a problem. What, what interests me the most, honestly, is that um, motherhood is always kept at uh, and like you know kept on a pedestal but uh, beyond motherhood the entire bodily agency of a woman and her choices her experiences and her sexuality is um, often um, projected in a way that um, that I think leads to many urban women many uh, women, even educated women to not own themselves completely it, it's it's there in the um you know consciousness of every woman who grows up to not love her body and what her and understand her body as much and um, many many women um report being very disconnected from their bodily experiences uh, leading to many issues uh, psychological and otherwise um and uh, that's something for a, for another day i suppose but uh, moving on from here um We'd like to know next uh, about, um, you know, we've noticed that there are some female saints and teachers, gurus followed across the world. However, we don't see female prophets or religious figures who lead as thought leaders to give rise to maybe new cults or religion. They're always working to reform or to maybe branch off, but are not seen as the ones who would um, lead to an established tradition or a new kind of tradition. Uh, and definitely in that sense, they uh, lack scriptural authority in, in the sense that most religious figures um, are uh, who, who have given rise to some of the world's uh, 
most um, renowned religions are all male. Um, and the female guru as mother uh, is seen more as a nurturing and supportive figure within traditions and never exactly as a thought leader. They are, uh, and, and while we, we look at that and the creative wisdom with which uh, women naturally, uh, you know, uh, try to be reformers, to facilitate life and to facilitate relationship building processes. Would you say that there is a scope of, um, you know, uh, understanding religious leadership in a more expansive way? Like in, in a way in which we can perhaps include uh, the role of um, women as thought leaders? Because uh, somewhere, I don't know if I am correct in perceiving this, but I've come across very few instances where women are considered to be thought leaders rather than, you know, being the ones who are supporting and adapting to um, encourage positive progress. What would be your insights on that? Thank you for this question. It's a very interesting question and something I am encountering in my own work because I am trying to treat women as thought leaders in my work instead of just seeing them as mothers and um, and just nurturing elements that nurturing is a big part of it but I think that is where we need a reorientation of our gaze I think the one of the reasons why we tend to make this distinction is because our scholarship itself has been very sexist in this manner in treating certain types of actions as intellectual and certain types of actions as maternal, emotional. And I'm trying to break this boundary. Where does the emotional end and the intellectual begin? Are they, are they very different things? Is thought not linked to feelings and are feelings not linked to thought? So another, I think one of, one of the things I'd like to start with is the question of founding religion. I don't think, uh, Buddha, Jesus, or Muhammad, any of them went out to find different religions, right? Jesus was trying to reform what he saw or felt in Judaism to be corrupt. And what he tried to tell his followers is to come back to the original path which had been corrupted. His followers later built an institutionalized religion out of his teachings. So it was, he, Jesus was never against Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And uh, even Muhammad, he falls, Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, falls within a certain tradition. And he, he doesn't talk about Islam itself means submission to God. It doesn't mean a particular religion. I think our understanding of religion has been a very retrospective category. So I, I personally believe all, all of those who we call thought leaders are ones who were reformers at heart. They were trying to reform what they saw as hindrances in the path of religion leading to God. That faith has been encumbered in so many other things, into so many other concerns, political, economic, social, that it wasn't being able to lead an individual to their self-discovery, which every faith tradition seeks to do. And what they sought to do was to remove those institutional mediations, the, 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 the things that came in between, and sort out the elements, the doctrines which work, sort of clean up a lot of mess. And then after a few more years, when they passed away, their followers built institutions because our tendency as human beings is to form communities, right? And once those communities, a few years have passed, those, those become institutions which you cannot question. But the very, if we look at, the, at it in a way, Muhammad, Jesus, Muhammad, Jesus Buddha, all of them were questioners. They questioned establishment and took what parts of received tradition worked. And in the process, they left us richer. And I think many female gurus also do that. But uh, the way we have seen, just because they have not written texts mostly, we tend to ignore the fact that they could have led 
thoughts as well. I would give an example from Anandamai Ma's life. Um, Anandamai Ma, uh, Colin Turnbull was one of the foremost British anthropologists who worked on the pygmies in Africa. Before that, he had come to India and lived with her as a brahmachari for a few years. And she had told him, you know, remember Satyam Sundaram, uh, Satyam Shivam Sundaram that truth, beauty, and goodness can be found in life. When Colin Turnbull went to study the pygmies, the Bhuti pygmies in Africa, he saw their community life, which is free from material pursuits. There was a keen sense of spirituality and connection with the forest. And he was reminded of Anandamuima's words, truth, beauty, and goodness. And that is what he found in the pygmies. Isn't that a leadership in thought to be able to sort of inspire something in a human being who, who comes from an alien culture and who goes on to study an alien culture? For Shobama, a 16 year old who had studied till class eight, she interacted with the noted savans of her day, including Mohammadha Gopinath Kobiraj, who was recognized by the British government as an authority in Indology at that time. And he was a noted tantric scholar as well as tantric practitioner who was well, well regarded within the saints, the fold of saints as well as the scholarship. His scholarship in Tantra was uncontested at the time. He comes, sits at her feet and asks questions of which about points in the text about which he's confused. And the 16 year old answers her confidently, causing her to fall at her feet. Is that not thought leadership? That's very interesting. I quite did not, I did not exactly look at it that way, but you're, you're absolutely right when you say that um, each, um, you know, uh, founder of any religion did not uh, start out to find a religion, but in the process of building community along the lines of uh, reformation, uh, indeed, there was social acceptance later and it led to um, the establishment of traditions. That That is really, really insightful. And it's, uh, I wonder why the, the same hasn't um, happened for um, a lot of female reformers. And uh, it's probably the way we write history, it's the way we perceive uh, of traditions and their role within traditions. And that's something that we need to question, absolutely. Um, now coming to our um, last question for this dialogue, what role does women saints play as bridge builders between different confessional communities? Can you think of examples of how they have held together communities and maybe furthered the cause of social cohesion um, and inter-community understanding? Um, I'd like you to reflect as an interfaith activist about the role that women have to establish relationships with uh, you know, members from other communities and how they would encourage actively and also through their own activities as women in community how, how they have um, always furthered this relationship building process to promote social cohesion? Um, well, before I go to the point of bridge building between different communities, I'd like to mention a point which I wanted to mention much earlier, but somehow it skipped in the course of conversations that in course of my readings, I've come across one thing that when I had asked myself this pivotal question, of course, but what is so special about a female guru and why are people drawn towards a female guru? Does she bring anything more to the table than a male guru or are there, are, and I think you asked this question at that time, the, the, this bit of the answer skipped me. <laughs> um, what, what is the pivotal difference? And I realized it's a question of approachability. To a certain extent, a male theologian or a male religious leader is seen as somebody very distant and representing law and scriptural authority uh, with whom the relationship is 
very strongly hierarchically and structurally mediated. But when you see a woman who you may call her mother or you may not, but you you find uh, you find her approachable. I think most of the uh, disciples of the female guru said that what attracted them was was this maternal compassion, this this nurturing tendency in their gurus. And you highlighted that that they're seen as nurturing and supportive guides. But I think we tend to, with our liberal feminist outlook, we tend to see motherhood as a negative category more often than not, something associated with lack of choice. But motherhood can be a very, very empowering category as we see in, in the case of these women. Because if you look at uh, Sharodama, can, can we go back to the slide? Can we go back to the slide number three? Merci. Copy that. Thank you. Yes, the third slide. No, the one before. Yes, this is a picture of Sharada Ma, who was the who is better known as the wife of Ramakrishna Paramhamsa because he is more famous and Vivekananda is even more famous than him. And in the process, we forget her, who herself was a guru and because we always tend to see her in terms of a wife and sort of a mother guru of Vivekananda, we do not see what was so revolutionary about her, her as an uneducated rural woman at that time. Look at what she says. I've highlighted here a quote from her. I am the mother of Shorot, who was an ascetic disciple of hers, of her husband's rather, and I am the mother of Amjad a Muslim petty thief. This Amjad, he used to be in jail most of the time. And when he would come out of the jail, inevitably he would come to her, eat at her place. She would feed him. She was a Brahmin widow. She fed him. And then what she did was she also cleaned the leftovers. An upper, that is an upper caste woman does not clean the leftovers of uh, somebody who is caste less even as a Muslim, not even a lower caste. That is a blit. And if you look at it in the late 19th century context in which she functioned, it is nothing short of revolutionary. Some of her relatives even sort of uh, berated her for it. They said, that you're collecting the dirt of 36 different lower castes. And she said, yes. All are mine. I have to collect all of them and take them to me. So what we for, isn't this a leadership in thought? Just because Vivekananda wrote books on this, of this universality of Advaita, doesn't make the fact that this woman d translates it into practice any less of an act of and motherhood. Feeding is a classic act associated with the mother of nurturing. So what I see them as, as those who translated these ideas into practice and showed us how a society can integrate progressivist, socially just values into their understanding of spirituality and religiosity. God as father, we inevitably associate with a sense of judgment and awe. But when God is mother, all we want to do is, in all our troubles, cling back to that, sort of go back to the womb. And that is the redeeming quality of divine that these women, or even women as female religious leaders, who are not even identified as divine mother, sort of embody the quality of approachability of divine as not something very alien and uh, something that is in a position of judging us, but a redeeming quality that we can earn in our ways, but we, that redeem, redemption is always available. So uh, that is it. But then I would, I would come back now to the question you had asked, which is how do they build bridges between different communities? And I, I showed the example of Sharodama, obviously, with, of a relation, equ equating Amjad and her ascetic disciple. And then I have the example of Anandamai Ma to give. She was a, of a Hindu saint. And 
one fine day, I think I have given this example before in the other talk we gave on the Interfaith Harmony Week. She read the namaz at a Sufi Pir's Darga and just came out of her. And she had followers from different communities, from different religious caste, national backgrounds who came to her. And a, a Catholic priest came to her and he said, do you think I need to convert to Hinduism? He said, why? You can't convert to Hinduism. Jesus Christ is a Rishta. Recite the name of Jesus Christ as you do and you will get salvation. So they have highlighted that no religion is untrue. All, relig all religions are different paths leading to the same God. And I would, I would like to end by showing the last slide. Can, can you show the last slide? Yes, yes, this one. It, who you see here is Mata Amrita Nandamai. She is known as the hugging saint from India. She is also of a low caste background, but what she does is she goes, she travels across the world hugging people. I would read out the quote from her. I don't see if it is a man or a woman. I don't see anyone different from my own self. A continuous stream of love flows from me to all of creation. This is my inborn nature. The duty of a doctor is to treat patients. In the same way, my duty is to console those who are suffering. So I have seen videos of Mata Amrita Nandamai. All she does, of course, she also leads meditations and bhajans and She's also fighting for a lot of social issues of equality. She's against forced prostitution. She also fights to make to bridge the gap between science and religion. But mostly what she does is she travels across the world and people come from far away to receive hugs. It just shows how much our world is starving for love across communities. She doesn't discriminate who comes to her. And I think that is the crux of what woman, the female guru has to offer, love. The idea in a world that is uncertain, that at times seems ruthless and selfish, I think everybody, irrespective of religion, community, caste, affiliation, is looking for some love. And I think at, at, that's the only thing I can end with, that a female religious leader has immense potential. I think even a male religious leader has the potential to do that. But I think as women who have in some sense or the other experienced marginalization in our lives, women tend to, they have the potential to understand what feeling neglected, what marginalization feels like. And to be able to provide a safe space where everybody can be their own. A child can be their own in front of their mother, right? That, that's, a, that, that's only safe space. So what if God is embodied in the form of a woman or scripture or whatever God says is embodied, it's being mediated through a woman where you do not feel judged, but you feel accepted. I think that is what female religious leaders can do. And just to prove my point, I'd like to end with one of the videos um, the one, the link I had sent. Uh, she's a female rabbi and she says why people come to her and what they find mostly. The greatest impact in the academy, I mean, there's been so many impacts. So like in other places, we've been filling the bookcase of Jewish life a bit, so we've been contributing. But I suppose the greatest impact is actually teaching people that rabbis um, are people who go on a journey with you, who enable you, who nourish you, who don't tell you off and judge you. Now, I'm not saying that my, that, that my male colleagues do that, because they don't. But I think that the previous generation was more authoritarian. You know, is this OK, rabbi? You know. Um, deferential attitude and I think by definition in a way it's it's part of how patriarchy persists 
that simply women do not command the same respect. Just being women. Now, you could say, well, that's terrible, and you only had to look at what happened with the cabinet reshuffle and how the attack, you weren't here. You know, three new women in cabinet, all they were interested in, what they looked like, their legs, their, I mean, it's just the same old, same old. But actually, the good spin-off of not com instantly commanding respect is that people doing approach you and are able to hold a conversation with you and be themselves with you and sort of do things and engage. I mean, like the, not just women who've learned to be involved in Jewish life. In my experience, men have been enabled as well. I can't tell you how many men have said, well, I have not done anything since my bar mitzvah. It was such a horrible experience. I was made to feel so inadequate, so told off. You know, it was such a terrible experience. Uh, but somehow, because it's not, I'm not re, you know, invoking those, that situation or provoking those memories because I'm female, they're able to engage and do things and feel that they can make mistakes and it doesn't have to be perfect and all of those sorts of things. So I actually think that's had a, it's having a huge impact. We just don't look like, you know, the rabbi stroking the beard and, and my male colleagues don't look like that either. But I think that... Um, we, more than them, because just the nature of being women, have, have really enabled that. So I'd say that was probably the biggest impact. As you can see, it does broach upon a lot of the points we covered today. It's not something very particular only to Hinduism or to Islam, but the fact that the ability that you do not feel judged, there is something about that women can, I don't say all bring and bring, all women bring that to the table. We all know that uh, uh, at this time uh, in our tradition, we have quite many female figures who are mouthpieces of fanaticism. So it, it's not always the case, but I think women have the potential of bringing empathy and approachability to the table where people do not feel judged, that they can be themselves. Maybe it's because they do not represent the traditional face of authority. Maybe that is the way in which they renegotiate and redefine authority by as authority in a way that you're being present instead of being a distant figure of judgment. This actually makes me uh, reflect on uh something very personal, which we would like to end with. Um, I've never exactly had a very um, traditional religious, um, you know, education as such since childhood, as most kids uh, don't have it in Hindu homes, actually, except for a little bit of the ritualistic practices, but not like systematic religious education. And um, being a woman who's always been, in a sense, the rule breaker, in the sense, the one who asks too many questions, and uh, the one who doesn't fit into the rule book all the time and keeps questioning. Uh, so I've been that girl when I was growing up. And I remember that, um, and, and now that I reflect retrospectively, I would say in the last 10 years, indeed, a lot of... Um, my spiritual journey and of understanding um, the value of religion and how it binds community and my entire orientation has been shaped by many women from different traditions who have graced my life at many different points. And um, that makes me wonder actually very critically if uh, the way I look at religion as a peace builder, as a tool to bring communities together and the way I look at relationships as being of most importance um, to the cause of any solution, or uh, you know, whenever we are even looking at development goals, I look at uh, partnerships and collaborations as a means to actually um, achieve uh, inclusive growth and development. This makes me actually wonder if all that is coming from the fact that I was shaped by so many women who have graced my life from different traditions, bringing in their values and that comfortable, safe space for me to evolve as a young girl. And even if you reflect as a young woman growing up um, in a really harsh world, I mean, 
that is what we also like we have these deepest discussions with our moms we have it with our aunts we have it with our sisters and all those you know gray areas and all those uh, confusing questions we somewhere seek a female figure to try and understand the gray areas understand all that is not fitting within the structure or are not exactly going by the rule book so there there is this entire um, entire zone of creativity of a creative interpretation and subjective uh, you know way of looking at one's own situation while being forgiving while being accepting while being compassionate to the self that i think uh, would be one of the most important contributions that women have brought to the table not to mention um, your examples also uh, reminded me of um, lal deer and her a uh, way of using language to take very complex con uh, concepts to the masses not to mention to weave in community um uh, in one value system i mean even if you look at early childhood development that's what mothers and the female figures i wouldn't just limit it to mothers uh, because that would be grossly confining the role the, the myriad roles that women play but uh, i think that is one of the core um core aspects of the feminine i wouldn't even want to limit it to women but the core aspects of the feminine to actually weave in these values and to constantly work towards um making sure that culture does not stagnate because of rules and structures which are important to make sense of the world and to actually have things working a certain way and to meet goals but at the same time there is there is this aspect of being genuinely caring and concerned of even members of other communities and that is i think where um, women have played incredible roles to um you know uh, bring communities together in also post conflict uh, situations in in war ravaged zones and in in the most um, cruelest atmospheres imaginable and uh, that that i think um, is a new way indeed to look at uh, the kind of leadership which the feminine aspect brings in and where it is very very important as an element to balance um when we are moving forward but as far as equality is concerned i guess there's a lot of work we are yet to do to create that uh, level playing field um but again that is for another day so um i would request uh to see to let me know if we have time for questions or should we um maybe take questions via email to see how much time do we have or have we overshot the time i'm sorry it's not showing here uh we are uh... hello yeah hello yeah to see yeah we are already uh, done it's 9 13 13 minutes more oh <laughs> okay so we have over short time by 30 minutes so we'll have to cut short the question and answer round but thank you so much for those who have um, stayed with us till the end we promise you that your questions will not go unanswered and we would definitely take them on um through emails uh please stay tuned for uh, all the reports from all of our sessions uh that will also trigger a lot of research questions for the future and um thank you once again to orkomitra for giving us her precious time and for sharing her insights and wisdom um there should be more women stepping into um study religion like you are doing and uh, let's hope that we have more generations to come who will follow in your footsteps and um thank you team for always being there and being so supportive uh, to every um gesture uh, that we make to share something new and for always being a sport and um, thank you everyone who tuned in who took the time to be here with us uh, we look forward to interacting with you in future sessions too so having said that we'll take your leave tonight good night please stay safe and uh, our heartfelt condolences for all the losses and for those who are suffering those who are struggling um we are here with you in spirit and we'll keep praying for you 
And uh, let's use this opportunity to pledge to actually help each other uh, beyond community, beyond um, anything else, just as one global family. Thank you so much and good night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for listening.